my name is Kathleen Carr, and I am the executive director of Newport Film. I am thrilled to welcome the director of After Sherman, John Cesare Goff, in conversation with executive director of Rhode Island Slave History Medallions, Charles Roberts. Now for introductions. Filmmaker John Cesare Goff is a multidisciplinary artist and arts leader. He has an MFA in experimental and documentary arts from Duke University. With extensive experience in media and film production, John has offered his lens to a variety of projects spanning many genres, including award-winning documentaries, Out in the Night, Evolution of a Criminal, and Spit on the Broom, among several other projects. Thank you, John, for being here. Charles Roberts is a native Rhode Islander whose family has lived in Newport since 1889. He acquired his BFA degree from the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan and was an independent producer promoter for Warner Atlantic Electra Records from 1979 to 1993, where he worked with artists such as Luther Vandross, Shaka Khan, Gladys Knight, and Run DMC. In Rhode Island, Mr. Roberts produced and promoted gospel concerts at Veterans Memorial Hall and the Providence Performing Arts Center while managing and producing First Night Newport from 2000 until 2009. Currently, Mr. Roberts is the founder and executive director of Rhode Island Slave History Medallions. Thank you, Charles, for being here. Thank you. So, uh, John, I'm going to turn to you to get this conversation going. Um, After Sherman is such a, a stunning and impactful film. What was the spark? What led you to make it? Uh, th there were so many sparks, but um, <laughs> for me, it 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 really started um, when my grandmother passed in 2012. Um, she was 98 years old, and and I just knew that th there was a quality of cultural texture um, that would no longer remain in, in my life. And, and so I immediately wanted to preserve <laughs> um, in celluloid and in, in audio recordings, um, photographs, as much of what remained um, of that culture, of my culture, as, as I could or as I can, because I think it's still an ongoing process. And after Sherman, is just one part of that. Absolutely. Um... And it, it's so um, stylistically innovative. Um, can you talk about your intentions for the film and what you used as inspiration as you kind of constructed it? Yeah, there was so much inspiration. Um, and and I think I liken it to um, a quilt often. You know, like I, I say, I, I don't do the traditional Gullah Geechee folk arts. I, I don't weave baskets, <laughs> sweet grass baskets, and I and I, I don't um you know um make quilts per se, but I make visual quilts. And um early on in the process, I, I was speaking um with um a mentor and advisor, um Rick Powell, arts historian, and and he suggested that I revisit Alice Walker's short story Everyday Use. And and so this was before I even started filming and and that became a bit of a compass as well. Um, so thinking that this quilt can be something that either you wrap yourself in and you use it for utility or or something that's exhibited and displayed, you know, and preserved in that manner. And and so I wanted the film to operate on, on both of those levels where where there's both a practicality to it, um, something that you can you can wrap yourself in, such as the music and the the soundscape. I think it's something that I want it to be immersive, but then I also wanted it to be something that um, had aesthetic value, you know. And and so the handmade quality of the um, of the animation sort of mirrors my own handmade or quality of the the film itself, um, um, where much of it I, I filmed, you know, alone, <laughs> much like a a large format photographer with a with a tripod just planning myself in, in locations. And, and so that that is sort of what you see. I wanted the seams and the edges to be visible because this, you know, it, it is a construction and it is highly subjective to to my understanding of the culture and and um, and the issues in the film. And in your your background is in cinematography. Right. Yeah, so it visually like it, it that was very present um, 
Yeah, and, yeah. and my, my producer, um, Blair Dorishwather, who I was a cinematographer on, on their film, Out in the Night, yeah. jokes early on, like maybe year three, that it was time for me to start working with other um, DPs and other cinematographers because she was like, there's no way you could have shot this. And I was like, I did, but I was also doing sound and I was trying to wrangle people. And she was like, you've got you to gotta slow down and, and direct. And so... Um, I was able to have really deep and meaningful collaborations with other cinematographers on the project as well. Oh, so that's interesting. So that was like a, an interesting kind of transition for you to kind of um, collaborate in a different way from that perspective. So what, was it difficult to let go, would you find? Or yeah, okay. Yeah, I liken it to, um, there's a scene in the film, The Five Heartbeats, where Duck, who's the arranger, composer for the group, um isn't allowed to play the piano for one of their performances and the whole time he's looking over like man they're like not quite getting the notes right and so 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 th there was a lot of that but but you know I worked with people that I I really really trust and, and admire so I was able to to relinquish some of that control yeah well it's I mean it, it's stunning so um um I wanted to ask you about as a filmmaker and, and also from the perspective of a, a pastor's son, um, you know, when the um, the murders happened at Emmanuel AME, how how did that impact the film's journey in terms of, I mean, having to kind of incorporate that? What was that like from for for you as an artist? Well, I mean, I I claim many creative lineages and and one of them being experimental um, filmmaking and, and experimental art. And at that moment, I was confronted by two elders, two, two veteran filmmakers with very different perspectives. And one of them was sort of admonishing me <laughs> and saying that I didn't have the, the luxury of making an experimental film about this subject matter because I had to make something that was legible, something that was clear and conveyed sort of, you know, a, a, an unvarnished truth, if you will, yeah. um, and, and that the experimental form would perhaps detract from that. Um, so I think for me as, as an artist and a storyteller, the way that I was immediately impacted was that I was lost. Um, I, the, the, the vein in which I was working no longer felt appropriate. Um, the resolution that creating an artwork or a film as being a response to something so deeply emotional and personal didn't seem to satisfy. Um, and, and so it, 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 it derailed me for a bit. It took a few years to get back on course with the production because I wanted to capture those oral histories of church members and community mm -hmm. members in the immediate aftermath because I knew that the news was only portraying a fraction of that history, a fraction of that contemporary reality. And so we we have, you know, tapes or, you know, interviews with folks in the immediate aftermath that may not have made the film, but like will forever, um, you know, preserve that, that moment in time. And, and so I, I think it pushed me to be more than just an, an artist. It, it, it forced me to be an oral historian. It, it forced me to be a community member and be present at times where it would have been more advantageous for me to document and record. And, and really, I just needed to be present without a camera, you know, to, to, to be amongst those grieving. And, and so I had to negotiate and balance that, um, you know, for, you know, several months um, following the shooting. Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, um... That's it. I mean, and it's thank you for sharing that. That's um, that must have been uh, quite kind of a journey to kind of have to move through. Um, and I, John, I want to um, transition to Charles um, now. So Charles, reflecting on the themes of which um, John so brilliantly conveyed of, of inheritance and legacy and after Sherman. Um, can you talk about the work that you're doing at the Rhode Island Slave History Medallions? Oh, thank you. I'd love to talk about the work, but you know, his comments uh, were are almost like 
interchange in the work that I do. Yeah. Because he's talking about a legacy. Yeah. And I saw that in his film. And uh, since uh, uh, I've been raised by uh, people that fostered our legacy since I was five years old and, and came to uh, Newport in 1889, we know uh, uh, what it's like to, and we're church people. Uh, we, I mean, I brought Donnie McKirkland to Providence. <laughs> you know? uh, uh, and so we know what it's like uh, to have that uh, uh, call of the ancestors, if I would call it. I mean, because I've been in Africa and lived and worked there for a number of years in a number of different countries, Senegal and, and uh, uh, North Africa. I've been inside the Great Pyramid in Egypt. I mean, inside it in the Great Hall. And uh, when you get an experience that's affected like that, it becomes a, a part of you. It's a part of your memory, your ancestral memory. And so it's more than just hearing, it's feeling it. And I felt that in your film. And that's what we do at Rhode Island Slave History Battalions. Uh, we, we mark the landscape of stories of slaves and an enslaved Black and Indigenous people whose and their contribution to the history and the economic development of the state of Rhode Island through the use of their uh, enslaved labor. And so we tell these stories, and, and be honest with you, uh, uh, as we've been telling these stories, <clears throat> other stories in, have been unfolding of the unvarnished truth that you were trying to bring forward uh, in your film. The stories about uh, indigenous peoples and what they went through, how they brought black people into their tribes. And because of it, it cost them uh, a, a, their image. And in fact, the government used it against them to say that they weren't Indian anymore. This is what happened to the Narragansetts. And, this is and all my stuff is documented because to tell the story, I mean, I have problems because people that don't want to, hear this truth that have been programmed from the, the beginning of time to believe that George Washington never told a lie and chopped down the cherry tree, uh, don't want to hear me being irreverent about their uh, national heroes when these people were slavers. It was part of the economic development of the times. So uh, uh, I just wanted to share that with you in the context of slave history medallions and, and the memories that you brought about, we do acts of remembrance. Each time we install a medallion, it's a public ceremony that we invite people to come to so that they bring their kids and their families and they get a chance to experience that act of remembrance. And we know that by doing that, respecting the, our ancestors and, and the past, we bring something into the present that makes them realize who and what we are as Americans, because we're telling all of our stories right there where you stand, and we celebrate it. Uh, I do 60-second videos that I'd like to share with you in the future. they will show you, because I illustrate history, um, I'm a I'm a a, a a Revolutionary War reenactor. We don't just tell the stories. I live history. It's living history for me. When kids come up to me and see me in a Revolutionary War uniform, and you see the musket, and they see this black soldier standing there, and they say, and they ask me questions. You know what the biggest question I say, they say to me is, "Gee, that wasn't fair." And I said, "Yeah, but that's then." And uh, you are examples of a new kind of fairness today. So it's more than it, it's for me, anyhow, I'll say it's more than just uh, uh, telling a story. It's bringing the story of the past to the present and honoring it like you've and, done with your film. And Charles, you have been able to influence uh, policy in the state of Rhode Island through, through your storytelling and your work. 
Oh, yes. Well, see, I've gotten recognized by the governor and the, uh, uh, the House as a statewide education program to bring about this awareness. Such a treasure to have um, you and your work here in Rhode Island, Charles. Um, so, uh, John, um, before we let you go, I, I, I want to know what what's next for After Sherman and do you have any projects that you're working on right now that you can share with us? Sure. Um, what's next is we're, we're continuing to tour the film, um, working with a lot of cultural institutions and, and universities. Um, and and then um, it, it'll broadcast on PLV this summer. So it'll have its public television broadcast as part of the upcoming season of um, American Documentary PLV. Um, that announcement should be coming in a few weeks. And and in terms of what's next, um, I mean, the through line of my work is continuing to advocate and support other filmmakers and, and storytellers um, to to share share their stories um, because I, I'm, it's a it's a little um, cliche, but I think you know the shortest distance between two people is a story, uh, and and so I, I hope we can. Yeah come closer together in community um, globally through through the sharing of uh, an array of stories that have been under um, resourced and undervalued and undershared, um, like mine, you know, like when I started my project eight, nine years ago now, um, you know, people were telling me that it, it was not something that people would find interesting. And and I and I'm just in awe of the communities and the audiences that the project has been able to found, find. I was told it would it was too American of a story. It wouldn't have an international audience, but it had a wonderful reception in in Europe and in London. And so I, I want to continue to see this for other stories of all different backgrounds, um, providing qualified, uh, not not necessarily. A high quantity of story, but definitely highly qualified stories of um, of their their people and their communities. Um, and then for myself, um, I'm working on a suite of shorter projects that intersect with the Low Country and um, this idea of collective um, work and responsibility um, amongst both enslaved people and then um, the communities of of emancipated folks. And then um, I'm develop, co-directing a project with filmmaker Fern Perlstein, who directed The Last Laugh, uh, which is about um, the Holocaust in comedy. <laughs> uh, wow. very, very tough subject to approach, but she did it with such, <laughs> such <laughs> care and love that I was inspired <laughs> to collaborate with her. And we're, we're developing a project um, called A Fine Line which looks at um, sort of the moving line between offense and entertainment um, within comedy and race. Oh. <laughs> that sounds cool. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's cool. That's, that's, what we're yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's wonderful. And congratulations on the um, success of After Sherman. And, you know, obviously, you know, Newport Film is always going to be um, seeking opportunities to amplify all of these stories that you're contributing to. So, um, so thank you for everything that you're doing, doing with that short, shortest distance between two people, um, as a story. And, and yeah, so, uh, it's just, it's just so important. And, um, Charles, how, how can we get involved with the work that you're doing here in Rhode Island? Tell us, well, tell us what uh, can do. <laughs> well, you can go to my website, Risham, R-I-S-H-M dot O-R-G, and click on it and kind of uh, see our scrolling blog of videos and that are telling our story. And uh, uh, that's one way. And uh, contact me. I mean, so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, thank you, John Sesrikoff and Charles Roberts for um, joining us today here at Newport Film. It's been such a great honor to speak to both of you and for you to share your precious time with us. Um, Newport Film Screening screens impactful documentaries all year round, so you can stay up to date with the latest screenings at newportfilm.com and by following us on Instagram at Newport Film. Thank you both so much. 
and uh, be well, take care. And thank you everyone at home for tuning in. Thank you.